In Australia, there's this problem in the early 20th century. I have a little bit of a history background, so I like to start with history. I know very little about Australian history, but I'm going to tell the story anyway. Uh, they had a little problem in uh, early 20th century with a thing called the cane beetle. You maybe have heard this story before. It's kind of popular. Uh, the cane beetle was destroying crops. And uh, there was a couple other places, like Hawaii particularly, that also had problems with cane beetles. And so they brought in a thing called the cane frog. Cane beetle versus cane frog. Cane frog wins. Uh, Australia wins. That was, uh, that was the logic that went into it. They brought in the cane frogs into Australia, and they learned a lot of things about cane beetles and cane frogs. Uh, for instance, in Australia, the cane there grows to be about six feet tall, and the beetles like to go as high up on the cane as they possibly can, and that's when they learned that cane frogs don't fly, um, <laughs> and that cane frogs don't jump six feet into the air to catch cane beetles. So cane beetle beats cane frog, unfortunately. Um, they also learned that uh, cane in Australia um, grows in very arid places. Um, and the cane frog actually really likes the water a whole lot. Um, again, cane beetle beats cane frog, unfortunately. Um, they kept learning things like this. They also learned that when cane frogs don't have cane beetles to eat, then cane frogs wander around until they find something else to eat, like all the other little tiny animals that the Australians actually liked, um, like lizards and other things that they didn't want killed. And then they found out that cane frogs also are poisonous all the time. So when their neighborhood dogs started trying to eat the cane uh, frogs, um, cane frog versus dog, cane frog wins. Not the plan. So many of these things were unexpected. And the bottom line is that they went into a situation with uh, what seemed to be a simple solution. This has worked before in another place. Let's bring it over here. Well, we didn't know enough about it. And so this cane frog is coming in at a certain level, and the cane beetle is at a totally different level. This solution does not fit this problem in any way whatsoever. Interesting for story, Matt. Who cares? What if I told you your support looks a lot like a cane frog right now? Mm -hmm. You'd really not be happy with me. I'm sorry. I'm starting this whole thing off by not making friends. Um, I don't know anything about your support, so what, what, what am I talking about? But um, that's, that's, that's the analogy I want to kind of carry through this, this, this whole thing. In order to deal with customers in a, in a way that matters, in a way that is effective, in a way that's actually going to benefit your business, you have to meet them where they're at. If they're up six feet high on the, on the cane, you gotta meet them there. You can't, you're not gonna be able to bring in a cane frog to solve your solution, to solve your problem. You gotta meet them where they're at. Um, if your solution is gonna come in and end up wandering and poisoning your dogs, that's not a good solution for you either. Um, so let's talk about ways um, that are gonna help you, that where your customers are at, actually. Um, first of all, real quick, let me get a quick poll. How many of you deal um, with WordPress products like plugins, like I mean, as in that's your business. Your business is about pl plugins and themes and things like that. Raise your hand. Okay, very small. Now, how many of you deal with clients every day? Most of you. Cool. All right. How many of you don't deal with any of that at all? Anybody? Anybody? Okay. Cool. I still think it's going to be interesting. <laughs> Personally. All right, where are your customers at? This might seem obvious, but I have three areas that we're going to talk about in terms of where they're at and how you can approach them with your support. They are online. This sounds obvious, but trust me, it's not. They're at ground zero, and they're at a place of pain or excitement. These three things are really important. Um, oh, that's not running. Give me one second. All right, first point, they are, at, they are online. Of course they're online, we're all online, right? Um, and your products are online. If you're dealing with plugins and themes or um, 
then your products are online. Where else are they going to get them? They're not going to show up in a store and buy them in a store. They're going to buy them on your, on your shop. They're online. Well, I'm, I mean a lot more than just that. Let's go through it a little bit. They're on social media. They are on WordPress.org. They are on your website. They are on their email. These are all online places that matter to your customers, to your clients, um, where they are at all the time. And this is where you meet them. These are the places where you meet them. Um, let's go through it just a little bit. Social media. Uh, let's go through some myths about these things. For example, when I say you should be doing support on social media, how many of you think that's an awesome idea? Nobody, I know it. Yeah, <laughs> some people. There's a lot of people uh, blogging lately, talking about doing support through Twitter. Um, oh my gosh, really? Um, there's a lot of people talking about how they can actually get people from Facebook over onto their website to actually convert. These things matter to a lot of folks, but a lot of people are also complaining about these ideas. Um, for example, they say these, these these places don't convert. If you if you have a plugin on WordPress.org, for example, um, that you're trying to make a freemium product like Devin was presenting earlier today. Um, so a lot of people will complain, it just doesn't convert. I have like 10,000 downloads and like five sales. It just doesn't happen. Um, one, of the, one of the main myths about um, working with products online is that these places like social media and whatnot, they don't actually convert to sales. I need to get them on my website and I need it to happen there. Um, let me debunk that just a little bit. Online, it's really hard nowadays to actually know where the point of sale actually happens. It's really hard to know exactly where it happens. You can know where, like uh, your, your first thing you say is, oh, Google Analytics. I know, I, that tells me everything. No, 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 it, that tells you what the last thing happened before they bought. That tells you the last thing that they did before they bought. But that means that their decision was already made you know what their very last decision was. They woke up that day, they say, I'm gonna buy that plugin today. So they go to Google and they Google it, they click the link and they buy. That doesn't tell you anything about how they learned, they heard about your plugin in the first place. That doesn't tell you anything about where they heard about you or why they decided to buy it. Um, it doesn't tell you any of those things. It just tells you that they made a decision and that's how they found you and that's how they bought. So to say that these things don't convert is not totally true. At one point, they learned about your product maybe through a WordCamp, or they met you personally on the street somewhere, um, or they read about it in an article that somebody else wrote. Um, this is the same thing if you are a freelancer. Um, I know that was the case for me when I was freelancing. Where, did they come to me because of an article I wrote, or did they come to me because they had a friend um, that knew me? Uh, word of mouth, of course. Uh, I had plenty of folks who came to me through my website, through my contact form, and I could see where, where they came from. But why did they come to me from there? I did, there's, a, there's a whole trail that leads to that last point of entry. Um, um, another thing that I think is important to, to mention, when you're talking about support, uh, support doesn't, especially when you're talking about plugin and theme support, support is not necessarily tied directly to conversions. It's important to actually separate those things. Doing really, really good support should always end up imp um, improving your business. No questions about that whatsoever. But you don't do support in order for somebody to buy. You don't do support in order for somebody to, come, uh, to, to, to upgrade. You don't do support in order for them to uh, buy another product from you or buy another service from you. You don't do those things for those reasons. You do those things because that's your job, like period. Separation of powers, basically. When you have a plugin, specifically, you support your plugin because that's your job, and, or a theme, that's your job. And what that does is that provokes loyalty. It provokes customer loyalty to your product. It doesn't, it doesn't have to mean more conversions. Um, it will, though. It will, though. But you have to separate those in your mind. So my last point is, so when you actually do do that, it does mean that there will be better sales or there will be more referrals. Like when you do really good support to your clients, 
what is the thing that you're almost certain is going to happen? Well, they're going to recommend you to somebody else. They say, oh, I just got a website built. I absolutely love it. They were great. I'm going to recommend Sally to you because I know you'll be in good hands. So that's definitely something that you want to see happen. But you don't do it for those reasons. You do it, do it in order to support your product, if, whether your product is a service uh, or a physical or d digital product. Another myth. This is particularly true with plugin authors or theme authors. I don't do free support. How many of you have said that yourself? I know. If you're not raising your hand, you're lying. That's OK. Um, I don't do free support. So the repo gets totally, completely ignored. Um, the truth is, especially if you have a freemium product, especially if you have a freemium product, free support is gold. Free support is absolute gold. Because well, I already gave you the answer. Why? Because you already separated your support from conversions. You're not supporting this free product because, because you're giving away time for free. You're supporting this product because it's your product. And because you're supporting it, that means that the people who are using it are going to have loyalty with you. They're going to trust your product. They're going to trust what you do. And that will, in the long term, mean more sales. There are exceptions. There are some, uh, especially plug-in models, where they basically have a free plug-in and they sell support tickets. That's a different model. There are, so there are exceptions to this. Um, but generally speaking, free support, I always say free support is gold. The, mo the more you do a free support, the better off you're going to be. And in the end, it's not really even free because the idea is that you're basically um, investing into your plugin more because you know what's happening uh, with, with your users and your paid sales are actually basically supplementing your free time. So in the end, there really is no actual free support giving being given. Does that make sense? Cool. Last one on the online thing. I can't problem solve in 140 characters or less. That's actually probably true. But let me tell you why it's also Kind of a myth. Um, you don't actually provide troubleshooting uh, in, on Twitter. Is, is you actually really do have to be present in all these places. Your customers are on Twitter, like a lot of them, especially if you work with WordPress in any way. You'll find, I mean, to attend a WordCamp, you have to give them your Twitter handle. <laughs> um, you'll find that a lot of your users are, are on Twitter all the time. And if you're ignoring Twitter, you're ignoring your customers. They are there. Now, th they go, hey, I just installed your plugin and it gave me a white screen of death. Fix it now. You're not going to do that in 140 characters or less. Of course, they now let you do direct messages, blah, blah, blah. Um, you're not going to do that. But you are going to be human to them. Um, you are going to say, hey, I'm so sorry about that. Let me direct you to the right place so you can get taken care of right away. Um, you have probably a lot of different means in which you can help them. Maybe you have uh, a repo on, on WordPress. Maybe you have a private support forum. Uh, maybe you do everything through Help Scout. Maybe you want them to email. There's, you have lots of different ways that, th that you can help them. And Twitter is a great place to say, hey, I'm here. I heard you. So sorry. Here's where you need to go, and you'll get your answer. That's a success. That's a win. That's support. Uh, it's not necessarily troubleshooting. But it is support, and it's, the and it's a great way to be present. The other really great thing about being present on Facebook and Twitter and whatnot is if you are, how, how many of you deal with answering support tickets? Yeah. How many of you got a support ticket that says, it's broke? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It is funny. That's a, um, just because of how common it is. It's really common. It's broke. Uh, okay, we have a lot of plugins. Tell me which one is broke um, and why it's broke. There's there's a lot of questions that you need to know in order to to, pr to provide an answer to these people. So being present on Facebook and Twitter, they can come to you and they say, "I just installed your dumb plugin and it's broke." Okay, here's how you can help me help you. Help me help you. Um, you can. Tell the, be the on-ramp. You can help be the on-ramp for an awesome ticket. How many of you have had awesome tickets? 
where they like, yeah, it, sometimes it happens, right? Like the 0.2% of the time, it totally happens. <laughs> um, but you can, by being present on social media, you can help on-ramp a really awesome ticket. So say, so sorry it's broke. Here's where I can help you. Please provide this information. Boom, 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 boom. And then, and then they go and they actually do that. It's incredible. So uh, it's broke turns into this is how my problem happened and this is how I need you to help me fix it. Awesome. It's great. Next. Ground zero. Your customers are at ground zero. They are doing something. They're excited about it. And, you, and your plugin can either enable them, or your service can either enable them to make it happen, or it can sync it really quickly. Um, but ground zero also means, in a lot of ways, that they're at the framework level, where they have plans, they have ideas, and it maybe does, is not fully formed and not fully shaped yet. And you have the ability to help influence where this goes. Um, ground zero also means that in terms of understanding the technology that is required to make it happen, they're at ground zero. They're at, I don't get it, but I need it to happen. Um, ground zero means a lot of different things. So for plugin developers, theme developers, the best way to get at them right away at, at ground zero is to help them understand the plugin the minute they install it. This is actually a principle of WordPress in general. Uh, they call it out of the out-of-the-box philosophy, the out-of-the-box principle. You should be able to install the plugin and it makes sense. It should feel natural. It should feel like, ah, that's I wanted to do this one thing, and I hit activate, and now I feel like I know how to do that one thing. That's what a plugin should feel like. If, the, if they hit activate, and then it's like, okay, what do I do now? There's a problem, okay? But occasionally you have a plugin or a theme or you even have a service sometimes. I know that services are hard to pitch um, when they're complex services. Um, that does require some coaching, some e explanation. Um, and so in, this is how you also need to make sure that you're providing online documentation. Um, a plugin without online documentation is like that thing where you say if, if there's uh, a shotgun in the forest did it, did it, and nobody was there to hear it, did it actually happen? Like a plug-in without documentation is, well, does it actually really exist? Um, that's kind of how a lot of users really understand plugins without documentation. I installed it, I don't know what to do now, and you didn't tell me anything, so I don't have anything on my website. Thanks a lot. It's broke. <laughs> um, the other one you have to um, provide is uh, white glove services. This one is, is one that I think is a little bit um, controversial sometimes. It goes along with the, with the myth that says, I don't do free support. Um, you have to be able to be willing to handhold your users. So let's go through some of these myths quickly. So like I said, you should be able to come right out of the box. Uh, myth, my plugin is already intuitive. I don't need inline docs, it makes sense. Uh, first reason why that's not true, because it's not true. Um, it's not true. Um, you think it's true because you thought of the idea and you put it out and you're like, there it is. That's exactly what I had in my mind and now it's there. It's perfect. Well, nobody else thinks it's perfect. <laughs> so it might feel like it, but it's not true. And it ta like Devin was, I'm, I'm a, Devin's my partner. We work together a lot. I'm sorry, I keep referring to him because, you know, that's what we do. Uh, like he was saying earlier, <laughs> like he was saying earlier, it's um, basically you have to iterate all the time. It doesn't. It's not quite intuitive yet, um, but if you are actually doing really good support, it can get intuitive. If you're actually really meeting your customers where they are at, you do have the hope that it will be intuitive, um, because you're going to listen and you're going to iterate. Descriptions in your plugin or in your theme, don't hurt anybody. It doesn't hurt anybody to have them there. It's not gonna add bulk to your plugin. Um, it's not gonna be a problem. Uh, it's only there to help. It's gonna benefit them. Have a label, every single label should have a description or a tooltip or a link to online documentation.
something that says, if you don't understand what this does, I got ways to help you right now. Myth. Nobody reads docs. Why should I write docs? Because nobody reads them. How many of you think nobody reads docs? Oh, good. Awesome. People do read. How many of you read docs? <laughs> Excellent. Yes. There are lots of plug-in uh, uh, authors and theme authors, especially, especially theme authors, who say, nobody reads docs. Why should I write them? Nobody reads them. They're just going to go straight to my forum and say, it doesn't work, um, which is partially true. But um, there's lots of reasons why it might be true that, that people aren't reading your docs. Can they find your docs? I wrote all these docs. Well, there's no links to your docs. Like, how are they supposed to go from your plugin to your docs? Um, how are they supposed to find them? You want them to Google search for it? Really? Um, don't make it hard for your users to find your docs. Um, you write user docs, or the other type that I call is list docs, or developer docs. Developer docs are the ones that really are like, my code does all this awesome stuff, and this is how you can do more awesome stuff with my code. This is really what documentation in its purest form actually uh, means, literally. Um, but in the WordPress world, we sh really should be aiming more for user docs in general when it comes to plugins and themes, and even with clients. Um, list docs are, I call, this is kind of my facetious word for a lot of documentation that I see out there. This is where they list all the settings that are already in the plugin one by one and basically say exactly what it already says in the plugin, and they call that documentation. Has anybody seen stuff like that? Yeah. It, yes, yeah, it's, it's sometimes really painful. Um, a, li a list doc doesn't help anybody. What you need is you need to explain that those fields and why it's there and how people can leverage it and how people can use it. Those, to me, are what I call user docs, not list docs, not developer docs. So if you have list docs, yeah, nobody's going to spend time on your docs because that's pointless. If they're develop developer docs, those are great for developers. Uh, but they're not great for your users, and they're not going to spend time there. And they're going to say, I didn't read your docs because they aren't relevant to me. And then the truth is they do read docs. Here's some analytics from our Give uh, website. Basically, the, um, I kind of chopped this up together. Um, you can see here one. how much time is spent uh, on average on those pages. So if you do any time or, an, or, or analysis of your website, you know that time on site is a big deal and time on a page is often um, like less than a minute. Um, but people are spending time on these docs. Why? Because they're important, because they matter. And it helps them to understand your plugin and it's producing more loyalty. They feel like they can trust you. They can trust this plugin. The white glove service. Myth. I can't handhold everybody. Well, that's technically true. But if you have to handhold everyone, there's a problem. If you have to actually handhold every single one of your users, every single one of your clients, um, there is a problem. They are not understanding your service. Uh, they're not understanding what you're providing them. They're not understanding your plugin. They're not understanding your theme. So as soon as you recognize that you are hand-holding every single person, this is the time to be, okay, let's back up and let's start talking about version 2.0 because this isn't working. Hold though, in general, then you're just in the wrong business. When it comes to WordPress, hand-holding is part of the game. If you're going to build something and put it out there, there is going to be hand-holding that is had. Hand-holding will be had. I can say that five times fast. <laughs> hand-holding will be had. Um, get into, the, in, into that game. Hand-holding is also education. Hand-holding is paying it forward. I, I, you know that movie, Pay It Forward. You are paying it forward for the next developer that this user is going to be dealing with. Um, <laughs> Put that time into, into that person right now, and they're going to learn for the first time what a custom post type is. 
um, they don't know what a custom post type is. And you're going to spend that time, you're going to explain it so it gets easier for them to understand your plugin so that when they go to the next person, they're like, oh yeah, I totally know what that is. I'm good, we're good. You're investing that time to help them, to educate them. And if things are going well, maybe that first next developer that they come across is going to be you again. That would be great. of pain or excitement. They're at a point at which you have a lot of influence. You can help it go one way or the other. They are ready to buy, or they're ready to smear, or they're ready to cheer. That's how I typically do it. Only. They only want to buy because because of what the, the plugin or the theme or your service actually physically offers. That's not true. That's actually not true. Um, when's the last time you actually bought a car that you didn't recognize the name brand of it? Like, never. That just doesn't happen. You buy a car because if you're a Ford person, you like Ford. You trust Ford. You know, you feel like you know what's going into that car, regardless of which model it is. It's the same thing with plugins or themes or services. They're going to come back to your agency because they know that they can trust you and they know that you also have great features. So it's never only features. They are at a, a place right now where they're ready to cheer for you because of who you are as a team or as a freelancer, as an individual. Um, they ask you about Pro to see how you work as a team. They ask about your pro features of your plugin, not because they can't read your product page. They can. They can find that, that information out somewhere else. But they want to actually test the waters and see how responsive you are. If you answer the email quickly, they're like, wow, they're right on top of it. And if your email is detailed, wow, I can really count on them. They know what they're talking about, and I'm going to get quick responses. Um, they want to make sure that you'll be around in a year or more. That's another thing that's really important, when, especially when it comes to plugins. They can test out these free plugins that don't seem to have anybody really developing on them, and they're like, ah, you know, I can use that for a month or so. But if they're going to actually get involved with something significant, they're going to look around and try to find whether or not this is backed by a team or not, and really want to make sure that, that this plugin that they're going to put on their website is going to be around and more than six months, more like one year or more. Yeah. <laughs> Leave reviews. It's a myth. It feels true sometimes. Where can I leave a crappy review for your plugin? Well, you, I guess good support means I have to answer that question. Um, it's not true, actually. Uh, people are at a point at which they are happy to cheer. They're happy to cheer. People, especially in WordPress, WordPress users are generous people, generally speaking. They're generous people. They love to cheer for, for good things that are happening. Um, have you asked your happy users to give you a review? That's, I mean, from ground one. Uh, maybe you're not getting the reviews that you want because you just simply haven't asked. Are you asking for them? We know with certainty it's not true. Give right now, we have 46 five-star reviews. And that's not like an astounding number. It's wonderful and we're really happy about it. But if you look around at other really excellent plugins, there's lots of good plugins out there right now that are getting great five-star reviews. And it typically comes from, from folks who are giving really good support and are asking folks to leave reviews. Same thing with services. Are you getting good feedback from your users, from your clients? Are you asking them for that feedback? Um, you know, it, once the transaction is over, are you, do you just go, all right, or do you have an exit survey? Are you asking them these questions with an exit survey to find out? If they actually fill out the survey, do you do anything with it? Or do you just go, ah, better luck next time? Take those things into account. Myth, WordPress users expect the world for free. I know we've all heard this, or we've all felt this, or think this, and in some ways, I, un I sympathize, I understand why people feel that way. You might be desperate for, for sales, but they are desperate for solutions. They are really desperate for solutions and are willing to pay for it. It's absolutely not true that they just want to take things for free and walk away. 
um, especially folks who really want to do something really well. Um, in an open source uh, and WordPress world, generosity begets generosity. When you are being generous to your users, they are happy to be generous right back to you. If you want people to be cheering for your business and what you're doing, be generous, be open. Give them information that you don't necessarily publish on your website. Um, give them a free license because you feel like they're gonna take, run with it and do something else that's really cool with your plugin or your theme. Let them run with it. See where it goes. Respond with social media. This is the best one. If you're worried about doing support on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, like I said earlier, don't think about it in terms of technical solutions. Think of it in terms of being human. Think of it in terms of being um, human. Because <laughs> really, so many people are not very human on, on social media. Um, <laughs> and they will respond with social media. They will say, they will tweet it out. Just got some excellent support from WordPress. Highly recommended. People say that. If you, if you meet them where they're at, they'll respond right there. And, and getting that social proof in social media is a big deal. It matters a lot. In a nutshell, you're going to meet your customers, you're going to meet your users, you're going to meet your clients where they're at, and you're going to do it at all costs. You're going to try to interface with them on social media, interface with them um, in email, interface with them in uh, your support forums as much as you can, always going back and forth, always taking their feedback, making that inform your services, making that inform your products so you can continue to iterate your service, so you can continue to iterate your product um, and do that at all costs, at all costs, do everything that you can. Do it, supporting your customers at all costs can take you from this right here to this. Yes. Yeah. That's it. That's what I got. I tried to go steadily quickly because I have a feeling there might be some questions. The question was, should you have an autoresponding email to respond to, to informing them how to um, use your forum better, basically? Yes? Yeah, so if somebody asked a question about, you know, something's not working on the theme, I, I've gotten those many times where I've gotten email back and said, if you haven't already, please respond with a screenshot or show your forum or something. My instinct is to say no. Um, the, Basically, the question is, should you have autoresponders that say, thanks for filling out a ticket. Here's how you can fill out a really good ticket instead. Um, so I, my, my instinct is to say no. Um, instead, what I, when I, 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 you, I would avoid autoresponders in all cases as a rule in the first place. There are times when adding an, uh, an automation is going to help to uh, benefit your workflow overall, but that automation should always be purely transactional, as in like confirmed or denied or thanks so much. Um, purely uh, transactional. Autoresponders that try to act human are really transparently not human and just make, make you look cold and, and, un, and, and not sympathetic. Now. A good example of that, for example, what if they have more than one Reduce your work workflow with some pre written ones, but don't automate it out automatically. I mean, unless it's like verifying your license and things and have a workflow to, if you notice that they're not showing up in your system. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, generally avoid automated responses, like as even in 
Facebook and Twitter and whatnot, I think automated responses are generally not beneficial because that's the best place to start really having human response uh, because it's social media, trying to be social, um, not cold and agnostic. Um, but um, yeah, good question. Others? I did a damn good job. <laughs> No questions. Thanks.